Welcome everyone to the AEA AFA Joint Panel on Climate. Uh, my name is Michael Greenstone uh, and I teach at the University of Chicago. We have a absolutely star-studded panel today. Uh, I will introduce them alphabetically uh, and the way we will run it is everyone's going to make a presentation to begin uh, and then there, uh, I will lead a kind of moderated discussion and of course there will be uh, time for questions uh, from the audience. So uh, first up is uh, Maureen Cropper. She's a distinguished university professor at the University of Maryland, uh, a member of the US National Academy of Science, uh, where she served as co-chair for the Committee on Assessing Approaches to Estimates of the Social Cost of Carbon. Uh, professor Cropper has made influential contributions to the environmental economics literature including the evaluation of environmental regulation and the estimated value of the associated health benefits. Uh, her work encompasses a wide range of areas, air pollution, road safety, and energy efficiency. Uh, I, 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 I will probably embarrass her a little bit, but in many respects, I kind of think of her as uh, the godmother of environmental economics. Uh, everyone, someone everyone is looking for affirmation from. Uh, as an interesting, I did a little internet sleuthing uh, she began as a monetary economist. Uh, her first, her PhD dissertation was on bank portfolio selection with stochastic deposit flows. And I just want to note, Maureen, you've come a long way. <laughs> uh, we're happy to have you in environmental economics. And then there's a funny story about Maureen, which is that uh, she has had, uh, she's been at the University of Maryland for quite a while, but she's also had uh, a, a job at Resources for the Future in Washington, which has involved her driving back and forth quite a bit. Uh, and she said of herself, uh, I often think that when I die, I'll have my ashes scattered on Route 101. Uh, so uh, I'm sure it will be much more ceremonial than that, uh, Maureen. Uh, Jeffrey Heal is a Donald C. Waite, the third professor of social enterprise at Columbia's uh, Business School uh, and at the International Public Affairs School. He serves on the board of directors of the Union of Concerned Scientists as a member of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, where he served as a chair for the Committee on the Economics Valuation of Eco uh, Ecosystem Services. Uh, he's a past president of the Association of Environmental and Resource Economists and was not surprisingly awarded the association's prize, uh, given his work, for publication of enduring quality. Uh, Jeff's research is largely focused on economic theory and environmental economics, and his contributions to the field include frameworks for the valuation of ecosystems and the modeling of uncertainty uh, in climate change analysis. I didn't know about this, but you can, if you search long enough on the internet, you can find out that Jeff's real passions are photography and bird watching, uh, and I will see if he has any slides on those. Uh, we're also joined, fortunate to be joined by Bill Nordhaus. He's a Sterling Professor of Economics at Yale uh, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is a recipient of the 2018 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences for integrating climate change into long run macroeconomic analysis. Uh, he's responsible for the DICE model, the Dynamic Integrated Climate and Economy Model, which is a workhorse and foundation for uh, the ways that all of us think about uh, climate change. Uh, it draws upon neoclassical economic growth theory and climate science, and who would have thought it was possible, but Bill made it happen. Now, uh, I'll just say two additional points. Uh, Bill's known for uh, his macro work uh, and, and the DICE model, but one thing that I think has always been a slightly underappreciated about his work, uh, which is something I emphasize to graduate students all the time, is that every paper should have a killer graph. Uh, and I, I'm especially fond of some of Bill's graphs, uh, his paper in 1994 in the AR with Mendelssohn, Nordhaus, and Shaw of climate impacts in the United States. Uh, and then more recently, his paper in uh, the PNAS in 2006 on geography and macroeconomics. Uh, really beautiful graphs. Uh, for a fun fact about Bill, he grew up on a 50,000 acre sheep ranch. Uh, so I had to look this up. Uh, and so I would certainly count myself as the uninitiated with respect to raising sheep and also with respect to acres. But it turns out 50,000 acres is more than three times the size of Manhattan. Uh, so let's just all pause and contemplate that. <laughs> uh, so the way we're going to go from here uh, is 
I'm going to give a presentation uh, for just 10 minutes on what I will provocatively try to argue is that we don't have a climate challenge. We have a global energy challenge. Uh, then Maureen is going to talk about climate damages and the social cost of carbon. Uh, and then Jeff will talk about policy and the energy transition. Uh, and Bill will talk, I gave him a title, I hope it's right, uh, The Case for Climate Clubs. Uh, and uh, we will go from there. So uh, with no further ado, unless uh, one of my esteemed panelists would like to add anything, I think I will just jump in. So I will try to keep this to 10 minutes. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the what I like to think of rather than the climate challenge when climate is a central part of this is the global energy challenge. And you, I think this is well illustrated by the following picture, which is from Beijing, uh, which is now six or seven years old and actually things have improved in Beijing. But the way I think of the global energy challenge uh, is that every country or every society around the world is trying to manage uh, three different goals with respect to energy. Uh, the first is the need for inexpensive and reliable sources of energy. And you can see here, uh, if, if you've been to Beijing or China, you'll recognize it right away. There, there's a kind of visceral action in motion. And it wasn't very long ago that the guy in the car was probably on a bike and it's not gonna be very long to the guy on the bike is gonna be in a car. And what China has accomplished in the last 30 years with respect to economic growth, I would argue is without historical precedent. And much of that was made possible uh, by the access to inexpensive and reliable sources of energy. Uh, and so I would take as the first leg of the global energy stool of the global energy challenge is the absolute need uh, for continued economic growth and inexpensive and reliable energy uh, that allows for it. The second leg of the stool uh, is also visible, maybe even more tangibly than the economic growth uh, in this picture. And that's that the same energy sources that have powered this growth have led to this terrible smog. Uh, so this is the middle of the day in Beijing. You can't see the sun. The guy in the bike is very well aware of this. He has on goggles, a mask. Uh, and, uh, the use of the same energy sources that have produced a lot of economic growth have led to terrible health problems and local environmental problems uh, that have to be managed. Uh, and then the third leg of the stool uh, is that the same sources of energy, primarily fossil fuels that have produced all this economic growth uh, have also, uh, also involved the release of CO2. Uh, and the release of CO2 uh, in, is increasing the odds of very disruptive climate change. And so what I think all societies have to find a way to do, and they're gonna view it very differently, and I assume that's something we're gonna come back to, uh, is a way to balance between these three goals, and they are all gonna involve uh, trade-offs. Uh, and different societies are gonna see them in different ways. So that's my overall theme. Let me now run through uh, a couple facts that I think help illustrate all of this. Uh, so fact one is in the coming decades, uh, energy demand is going to grow quite dramatically and it's projected to occur almost entirely in today's developing countries uh, rather than the developed countries. Uh, and, you know, sometimes numbers have a very powerful way of making a point. Uh, and so if you just take per capita electricity consumption in the United States on an annual basis is about 13,000 kilowatt hours. Uh, in China, it's maybe four or 5,000. Uh, in India, it's about 1,000. In the state of Bihar, which has 100 million people, a third of the US population, uh, it's about 200 kilowatt hours. Uh, so that's not a sustainable state of the world if you're living in India uh, or in Bihar. Uh, and that shows up in these projections of uh, demand growth. Uh, the second fact, which is really you know, extraordinary, and I think would not have been uh, predicted uh, as recently as, you know, a decade ago, is the very, you know, the joke used to be that solar renewables will be competitive in five years, and that's always true. Uh, and we've seen very large reductions uh, in solar prices and wind prices, and then remarkable reductions uh, in batteries. Uh, so 
there have been very large reductions uh, in clean energy costs, but fossil fuels uh, remain less expensive. And of course, I've put in parentheses ignoring externalities. Uh, and on the left, we just have uh, the LCO LCOE or the levelized cost of producing a kilowatt hour of electricity. Uh, this is in the United States. Uh, and uh, so actually the comparison here is a new natural gas plant, the red line should be a little bit lower, uh, can produce a kilowatt hour of electricity for about four cents. Uh, and while there's been great improvement in the zero carbon uh, energy sources, they still remain substantially more expensive. Uh, and that's probably more true uh, in other parts of the world that don't have the bountiful natural gas supplies. Uh, this graph is a little complicated to explain given the time, but the main point is uh, to a, uh, uh, internal combustion engine cars uh, at today's battery prices would require uh, oil to be trading at about $150 uh, per barrel for uh, there to be equal costs for lifetime ownership. Uh, and so the way we've constructed energy markets, ignoring externalities largely, is still pushing people to uh, consume all of this, uh, to produce most of the energy uh, from fossil fuels. Uh, so th that would be all fine and well, except as I indicated in that picture, uh, fossil fuels increase pollution uh, and that shortens lives. And so I've created something called the Air Quality Life Index. You can look it up on the web. Uh, but here is the distribution of loss of life expectancy around the world. Uh, and you can see the United States is actually very clean now compared uh, to say the 1970s, but there remain large parts of the world uh, where on average people are losing several years of life expectancy due to particulate matter concentrations. And those particulate matter concentrations are uh, a, a consequence of the combustion of fossil fuels. And if you added it up across the entire world uh, the average person on the planet is losing, and this is, I found this kind of astounding, 1.9 years of life expectancy due to particulate pollution. That's more than the average person is losing to smoking. Now, of course, if everyone smoked, the smoking number would be higher. Uh, it's more than alcohol and drug use. It's more than basically any other external uh, source. And so uh, fossil, you know, this leg of the stool, the local environmental problems or health problems remains a very uh, important one associated uh, with fossil fuels or due to fossil fuels. Uh, so now let's turn to what I think the planners of this had uh, hoped we would only focus on, which is climate. Uh, I think, you know, the projections are very troubling and uh, quite challenging. Uh, people talk about the change in global mean temperatures. Uh, as a couple degrees. I, I find that very hard to relate to, uh, not the least because I went to the Chicago public schools and I still have a hard time between uh, Celsius and Fahrenheit. But here's a, I, I think a better way to talk about it is what's gonna happen to the distribution of daily average temperatures. And in blue, you have India. So the typical day in India is about, there's about 60 days a year for the typical person where the temperature is between 79 and 81. But red is what's projected to happen at the end of the century. And here you can see a very large increase in these very hot days. And that's where most of the bad stuff really happens. That's where you have crop failures. That's where there's lots of stress put on human health. Uh, and uh, so I think it's better to think about uh, what is going to happen at the uh, extremes. So where are we on preventing the red from happening? Uh, I think, you know, we're still in very early days with respect to that. Here's a projected time path of gigatons of CO2 equivalent uh, that's expected to be emitted. This, the red line is under kind of a no action scenario. It would have uh, climate going up, the average mean temperature going up by about eight degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. Uh, the two degree pathway that the climate scientists, which is different than the economists, uh, would have us be on is something like the green one. So the gap is the necessary reduction in emissions. Uh, and then the blue line is, you know, some kind of approximation to what the Paris Agreement uh, uh, aimed for. Uh, I also wanna to turn to, we're learning more and more about uh, what the impacts of climate change are gonna be. Uh, and uh, the, 
I'll, I'll just say what's emerging from that is, uh, I think, a very different picture than we had understood previously. Uh, so here is the Obama administration's social cost of carbon. Here's the Trump one. Uh, but we're now beginning to get much more detailed microeconometric estimates in energy demand, mortality, and agriculture. Uh, and they're changing, they're altering our understanding. The impact on human health is at least uh, an order of magnitude larger than we had previously thought. That is kind of, uh, if you could unpack some of the integrated assessment models, uh, they would produce something like this. The new data is producing something like this. Uh, Another, and I think this comes back to the global energy challenge and how every country is gonna see things differently. Another thing that comes out of this is the inordinately heterogeneous impacts of climate that we're now uh, beginning to project. Uh, and you can see that in this map of the world. You can see there's vast swatches of the world where uh, mortality risk will go down, uh, but there aren't very many people who live there. Uh, and then there's big swatches of the world where lots of people live uh, where there's projected increases uh, in uh, mortality. Accra is a really good example and a good counterpoint to Oslo that's expected to have large reductions. Accra is uh, projected to have uh, very large increases in mortality risk. And this heterogeneity, I think, greatly complicates our ability to do something about climate because uh, the idea of having some global price on uh, carbon requires everyone coming to some common understanding or agreement about what the impacts are. And I think this map uh, undermines or makes, makes it clear that that is, would be difficult. Uh, you know, here's just uh, a little bit more to underscore some of the complications of the global energy challenge. Uh, the two degree pathway, I showed this to you a slide or two ago, but I find this version of the graph very compelling, uh, would require that the path of global emissions goes something like this and then shoot down in a way that appears you know, historically unprecedented. Uh, the other thing to point out is the very countries that are so desperate for additional economic growth uh, and, that, uh, and for energy consumption uh, and are the very countries uh, that uh, uh, are uh, sometimes poised to be kind of in a very bad position with respect to climate are the ones where lots and not lots, uh, you know, 60, 70, 80% of uh, global emissions are projected to occur, CO2 emissions. So I find that is kind of at the heart of the global energy challenges, like the very people who need more energy consumption and are least well positioned to spend a you know, more on clean energy sources are the countries where just by the arithmetic, the largest reductions of CO2 are gonna to have to happen uh, if we are to uh, prevent uh, disruptive climate change. Okay, uh, and then I'll just kind of wrap it up here with where we are on policy. You know, where we are on policy is current US policy, I think is quite piecemeal and often expensive. Uh, we don't have a, you know, economy-wide carbon price. Instead, we have a bunch of uh, policies. They all, uh, uh, in general, they tend to be quite expensive, whether or not you use as a benchmark the Obama social cost of carbon or California's, uh, the, the price on carbon in California CO trade, it's a uh, cap and trade market. They're depending, either benchmark leads to these looking like pretty expensive policies, not a lot of bang for the buck. Uh, and if we now step out and look globally and come to the two main market failures, which are the failure to price this externality and uh, the R&D uh, failure, uh, you know, by my calculations, the global price on carbon is about $2.48. That's averaging across all parts of the world. Most parts of the world have a zero. Uh, and energy R&D share of GDP, at least in these uh, five major countries, uh, does not look very high. Uh, this peak was in the 70s around the oil crisis. Uh, so uh, I'm, some of my friends accuse me of this talk being a little uh, dark. So let me now turn to and conclude with, uh, do I see some reason for optimism? Uh, and I think the answer is yes. Uh, you know, in the last year, there have been really substantial and meaningful commitments. Uh, the EU has pledged to cut greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050. 
Uh, President Xi set a 40 year target uh, and, and path to carbon neutrality in China. And then of course, a lot uh, with respect to the United States turned on the election uh, and uh, the President Biden or President elect Biden has now uh, seems to be will be taking a different focus and uh, emphasis on respect to climate change uh, than President Trump did and it's put together you know a quite stellar team. Uh, so let me just conclude uh, with our guy on the bike in Beijing. Uh, I don't actually think of this as a climate challenge. I think of it as the global energy challenge. And the trick is every society or country around the world is going to have to find a way uh, to balance between these three goals of inexpensive and reliable energy, local environmental health problems, uh, and climate change. And much of that challenge uh, rests on people around the world seeing it very differently, the problem looking very different uh, from their perspective uh, than people in other places. And so let, let me conclude with that. Uh, and I will now hand the baton uh, to Maureen, uh, if I can manage this, uh, who I think is all set to talk about the social cost of carbon. Thank you, Michael. That was a great introduction to the panel. I think absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm gonna talk about climate damages and their role in climate policy, which does mean that I'm gonna be talking about the social cost of carbon, i.e. the dollar value of damages from emitting another ton of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And I'm gonna focus on two questions. Uh, the first is how should we calculate the social cost of carbon? And the second is why should we calculate the social cost of carbon? And I think there's no better way, uh, well, first of all, I'll elaborate on these questions. Uh, first of all, I will talk about how the social cost of carbon was computed during the Obama administration. We saw a little bit of their estimates in Michael's slides. I'll talk about how the social cost of carbon could be improved and is being improved um, since 2016. I will also like to talk though about why we should compute a social cost of carbon. And the reason for this is that the United Kingdom abandoned the social cost of carbon in 2009. They said there was just too much uncertainty in the social cost of carbon, so instead, what we should do is to look at the marginal cost of reducing CO2 along some path. That's much more certain. Um, the two degree centigrade goal of the Paris Accord ignores the social cost of carbon and the high level commission on carbon prices, which was led by Joe Stiglitz and Nick Stern was against using the social cost of carbon. But thankfully, Bill in a PNAS uh, article in 2017 said, the social cost of carbon is the most important single economic concept in the economics of climate change. I also think that if we're gonna talk about climate damages and their role in policy, there's no better way to begin than with Bill's 1992 DICE model, which as I'm sure most of you know, integrates basic climate science, the biophysical impacts of climate and also economics to construct climate damages. The DICE model is computing optimal growth paths, taking into account climate damages and the cost of reducing emissions. And I think it reinforces a very important point that I hope we will come back to on this panel, which is that costs and benefits should be balanced in setting climate goals. The initial estimates of damages in DICE were very simplified. They have been widely criticized, but two points. First of all, they have improved over time. I think I'm quoting the most recent version of DICE here, the 2016 R3. Um, but more importantly, because DICE is open source, what has happened is literally dozens of economists have modified DICE with updated estimates both of the impact of emissions on climate, but the impacts of climate on damages. In DICE, I think it's important to emphasize the social cost of carbon is being calculated along an optimal path. We're looking at the impact of emissions of consumption along an optimal growth path. So now we come to the US government. 
Um, I think largely or very much due to the efforts of Michael Greenstone, who was the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors in 2010, the Obama administration formed an interagency working group to estimate the social cost of carbon. And that group continued until 2016. Uh, just to make sure again, in terms of what they were trying to estimate, uh, the present value of global damages from emitting a ton of CO2 into the atmosphere in a particular year. They did this for 2020 through 2050. And the goal was to look both at the positive impacts of increases in CO2, as well as the negative impacts, including changes in that agricultural productivity, energy use, human health, property damage from increased flood risk, and other impacts. So what the IWG did was not to look at the social cost of carbon in the context of an optimal growth model, but to break down the estimation of the social cost of carbon into four steps. The first step is to project population, GDP, and emissions over the next 300 years. Why 300 years? Um, if you emit a ton of CO2 today, 30% of it will still be up there 300 years from now. And therefore, Inherently, there is uncertainty in these projections, but it's necessary to go far into the future. Then you need to look at the impact of emissions on temperature, on mean global temperature, but also downscaling this to regional temperature impacts, looking at impacts on sea level rise. Then the damages associated with these climate impacts have to be quantified and then monetized and then aggregated. And finally, because we're talking about 300 years, they have to be discounted to the present to constitute a single present value. So this, these four steps are done for baseline emissions and then with a pulse of CO2 added and the social cost of carbon is the per ton difference in the present value of damages due to the pulse. So when the IWG did this, they relied on three integrated assessment models for both the climate science part of the analysis, but also for the impact of climate on damages. They used Bill's model, but they also used Antoff and Toll's fund model and Chris Hope's page model. They looked at five future scenarios for GDP and emissions. They treated them each as equally likely and to harmonize the different assumptions about the climate system in the three IMs, they used the same probability distribution over equilibrium climate sensitivity, that is the impact on mean global temperature of the doubling of atmospheric CO2. Importantly, they did use three different discount rates. They used a constant exponential discount rate. The focus was on OMB's 3%, the uh, consumption rate of discount, but there were also others considered the 5% was to allow for positive correlation between climate damages and the discount rate. The 2.5% was to take into account some of the literature on declining discount rates. And what they presented, and this is, these are the most recent estimates from this group, um, is shown at the bottom of the slide here Again, there is and there should be a distribution over the social cost of carbon conditional on the discount rate to reflect the uncertainty in the future socioeconomic emission scenario, uncertainty in the impact of emissions on climate, and then uncertainty in the effects of climate on damages. Um, the numbers here on this graph are unfortunately, well, they are in 2007 dollars, so you've got to increase them by about 25% to get to current dollars. So if we looked at the 5%, $12, this would be a mean social cost of carbon of about $15 in 2020 dollars. The central estimate would be about $52 and the two and a half percent discount rate estimate would be about $77.
So these estimates were actually very widely used, um, first of all, to calculate the benefits of avoided emissions in federal regulations, many of them energy efficiency regulations, dozens of these regulations actually. Um, it is also the case that these estimates were used by the World Bank in project evaluation. So if a project was going to reduce carbon emissions, then on the benefit side of the project before you got the rate of return, um, you would actually monetize these benefits and likewise the emissions of CO2 um, were monetized using at least initially the US social cost of carbon. 11 states have used the social cost of carbon to evaluate energy and climate policies. The link here is to a website that the Institute for Policy Integrity maintains where you can read all about this. And the Canadian government also adapt, adopted the US value. Of course, things have changed since 2017. At the beginning of the Trump administration, the IWG was disbanded. The United States has to continue to, to calculate the social cost of carbon. That's actually been required by judicial ruling, but now the social cost of carbon reflects only domestic damages rather than global damages. The discount rate's been raised to 7%. The pre-tax return on private capital, um, OMB's official um, measure of that of 7%. One week before Donald Trump was inaugurated, the National Research Council released a report recommending how the social cost of carbon should have, could be improved. I should say that the IWG, the Obama administration actually requested this report, um, which Renewal and myself co-chaired it, and the sort of Cliff Notes version here of our recommendations are these four, four bullets. We said that it was important to derive probability distributions over future paths of population, GDP, and emissions. Clearly a very difficult task, um, which could partly be done perhaps using econometric techniques, but in terms of projecting what, path, what, what policies are gonna be pursued in the future, um, expert elicitation is important. We recommended using an improved climate model to predict climate impacts at the regional level. The FAIR model was developed by members of the committee. Importantly, we said, look, there has been this big increase in research on climate damages since 2010. It's very important to quantify and monetize damages by sector and region and to use this literature to do this. And finally, we did not recommend using a constant exponential discount rate. We thought, look, if you're going to be looking at different scenarios with regard to future GDP and damages, if you select in the first bullet a high GDP growth path, the discount rate that you should be using to discount damages should be higher than if you're along a low growth path. And I can't go into all of this, but we made very specific recommendations regarding discounting. To give a little bit of a feel for the advances that have been made in estimating climate damages, I think it's appropriate to point to the Climate Impact Lab at the University of Chicago, which is headed by Michael, along with Trevor Hauser, Bob Kopp, Saul Shang, and the goal of the Climate Impact Lab is to quantify damages at a fine spatial scale, 25,000 regions around the world, and importantly, to use quasi-experimental methods to produce estimates of damage functions. Damages are being quantified for health, for agriculture, for energy, for labor productivity, conflict, sea level rise, also migration, and the important thing is that these are damage functions. They depend on per capita income as well as climate variables. Um, results for the US were published in Science back in the summer of 2017. And this past summer, a major study was released estimating and monetizing global mortality risks from temperature. And just to give you a little bit of a feel for these results, um, this is a map 
showing climate damages from actually eight sectors as a percentage of GDP in 2100 under our CP 8.5, I think it gives you a feel for the importance of actually estimating these damages and estimating them at a fine spatial scale. I'd also like to call out and recommend uh, that we consider the project at Resources for the Future, which is headed by Kevin Rennert. The point of this project is really to try to carry the ball with regard to implementing the recommendations from the NRC report. I'm not gonna go through all of the bullets on this slide, but the point is that the information that is being generated by this project is being provided as the last bullet says on a publicly available platform. This is encouraging researchers from around the world to provide their inputs with regard to each of the components of the social cost of carbon. So finally, I'd like to go back to this question of why should we estimate the social cost of carbon? As I mentioned, um, this was abandoned by the UK and replaced by the marginal cost of reducing carbon dioxide along a desired emissions path, uh, which is also what was recommended in the high level commission on carbon prices. This raises, of course, the question of how to determine a desired emissions path. Certainly, there are many proponents of setting climate goals based by, well, either based on science, quote unquote, alone. Um, for example, limiting temperature increases to less than two degrees centigrade. Although you do, really do need to worry about the path you're gonna use to get there. That's not necessarily well-defined. Um, or you could set the path, and, or I should say the goal based on political considerations like getting to net zero by 2050. Um, what concerns me about this approach, well, there are a couple of things. First of all, in terms of determining exactly what the marginal cost is along an optimal path, if you've got a simple model in which firms and consumers are all cost minimizers, it's easy to trace out what the marginal cost of reducing CO2 is. Um, as you saw from one of Michael's slides, if you look at the real world in terms of what the marginal cost is of reducing CO2, um, I think that's a very different matter. So in terms of this being something that's sort of more certain and easy to calculate, I would, I would uh, I guess, argue with that. There's also, quite frankly, the issue of, uh, you know, if you really do want to measure the marginal benefits, you're measuring the marginal costs. So let me end, and this is my last slide, by talking about why we should compute the social cost of carbon. I think the, the main point I would like to make actually from this talk is that in setting climate goals, you want to balance benefits and costs. I think if I were to summarize um, at least some of Bill Nordhaus's contributions, I would say that's one of the most important ones when you're setting a temperature target, such as 1.5 degrees centigrade, you're implicitly making judgments about damages and the value of avoiding them. You're just not making them explicit. You're also not avoiding the uncertainty that are, that's associated with climate impacts and climate damages. When you calculate the social cost of carbon, you make these judgments and these uncertainties explicit. I also think that calculating damages is important to garner support for mitigation measures. Um, people around the world will suffer, and Michael showed us um, in India and parts of China how they will suffer in terms of the temperature, the mortality impacts of temperature. I think you need to calculate damage to really garner support for mitigation measures. Also, um, although you want to take adaptation into account, if you measure damages before you take adaptation into account, you can help estimate the benefits of adapting, which is an important component of climate policy. And finally, for regulatory cost benefit analysis, I think we need to know the social cost of carbon. So I will stop there. Uh, thank you very much, Maureen. That was terrific.
Uh, next up, we have Jeff Heal. Great. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> it's a real pleasure, a real honor to take part in this discussion with such a distinguished group of people. Um, I'm going to give a very quick overview of how to solve the climate problem, what steps we need to take in order to solve the climate problem, and where we are with respect to each of these steps. Um, <clears throat> It'll be a slightly depressing talk in some ways, unfortunately, but I think it's also quite enlightening in many ways. Um, <clears throat> to solve the climate problem, we basically have to do four things. One is decarbonize electricity production, decarbonize transportation, decarbonize the generation of heat, by which I mean heat for space heating, water heating, process heating, and industrial activities, and so on. And finally, reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. So if we can do those four things, we'll, have a, we'll make serious progress towards solving the climate problem. <clears throat> Otherwise, unfortunately, we won't. Um, this gives you some sense of the magnitudes. This is with the US economy alone. Transportation generates about 28% of, of, of CO2 emissions, of actually greenhouse gas emissions in total. Electricity, 27%. And uh, those used to be the other way around. It took us a couple of years ago. Globally, electricity just head, is head, ahead of transportation. This is what I've referred to as heat, which is industrial, residential, and commercial uses of uh, uh, sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Most of this comes, as I said, from heating space, heating water, and heating industrial processes such as refineries, steelworks, and so on. Um, so I'm going to talk about each of these in sequence, what we're doing with respect to electricity production, transportation, and then heat. Uh, <clears throat> The key thing about electricity production is the change in the cost of various technologies, which Michael has already talked about to some degree. Um, this is a slightly different set of data from Michael's. This comes from Lazards, the investment bank, uh, who are the main bankers to the <clears throat> utility sector here in the US. And they compile data from their clients on the costs of various technologies, which they then make available on their website. And this is the latest round of data. So on the vertical axis here, you've got the cost of producing a megawatt hour of electricity. Um, it's going from $20 to $380. And the horizontal axis, sorry about that, is years running from 2009 to 2020. The way you interpret this is this line here, for example, refers to single cycle gas turbines. It shows that back in 2009, you could produce a megawatt hour from a single cycle gas turbine for $275. Now that's down to $175. Um, the really interesting one, of course, is this one, just solar PV. It shows that back in 2009, a megawatt hour from solar PV cost you $359. Uh, today, it costs you $37, down by a factor of 90% or more. The other interesting one, actually, is this one here, which is wind, uh, which goes from $135 a megawatt hour back in 2009 to $40 a megawatt hour last year. Um, What's interesting about this is that the two least expensive ways of producing electricity in the US today are wind and solar. This here is a combined cycle gas turbine, which is about 50% more expensive. This is coal, $112. This is nuclear, $163. And then we already talked about single cycle gas turbines. Now these figures here, 40, 30, these are average figures over all sites in the US. Um, the costs of solar and wind power vary quite a lot from place to place. So for example, in the Southwest, the cost of solar power will be less than this. Um, in the Midwest, in the windy areas, the cost of wind power will be less than this. On the other hand, around here where I am in New York, the cost of solar power is way ahead of this, more like seven, uh, seven, seventy dollars a, a megawatt hour. And the cost of wind power is higher too. So these vary a lot with respect to location. But the interesting thing is, that as, as Michael emphasized, the costs have come down immensely by a factor of 90% in the case of uh, solar. And these are now highly competitive with other sources of power. And Michael actually showed this diagram too, uh, which is the cost of batteries has come down from roughly $1,200 a kilowatt hour of storage capacity to about 100, 150, roughly speaking, today. And that's expected to drop by a further sort of 30 to 40%, leaving it somewhere in the 60 to $70 region. Uh, within the next five to 10 years. So the costs of um, integrating renewable energy into the economy have dropped massively. Because of that, you can calculate what it would cost to replace all fossil fuel power stations in the US by renewable energy power stations. It's a calculation I did in an NBR working paper released last year. Um, I won't go through the calculations in detail here, obviously, but the bottom line is that uh, the cost of replacing coal and gas power stations in the US by renewable energy plus storage is now quite manageable. 
it would come to something of the order of $10 billion a year every year from now to 2050, which is actually a rather small sum of money uh, by the standards of this, this area. The calculations are mildly complicated and there's a couple of assumptions you have to make. It's the biggest single assumption you have to make there uh, concerns how, how much storage capacity you need. So you can see from this, I've built in a trillion dollars worth of storage capacity. Um, I guess it's slightly over a trillion dollars. Uh, that's based on some calculations which are quite difficult to do uh, and it's not at all clear that they're correct. I mean, many people have tackled this and they all get roughly similar numbers, but I think this is still an area which is very much in its infancy, how much storage we're gonna need in order to, to buffer the, the intermittency of renewable energy. But anyway, the bottom line here is that the cost of replacing fossil fuels in power generation, which is one of the four things we have to do, only one of the four things, is now quite manageable. Uh, and you can see, incidentally, this shows, you CO2, this shows you greenhouse gas emissions from the power sector in the US. And you can see that's been falling since roughly 2005, 2006, uh, 2007, actually, I guess. And that's down significantly, not enough, obviously, but significantly. So the bottom line is we are making power progress in phasing out fossil fuels in power generation. We have a long way to go, but we seem to be setting off on the right road. What's been driving this? Uh, feed-in tariffs in the European Union, uh, which have been in place for a long time, very generous feed-in tariffs for renewable energy. Uh, similarly, st state-level RPS is here in the US, <clears throat> coupled with the federal uh, ITC and PTC, and very big subsidies to renewable energy in China. All of these things have effectively moved us down a learning curve a long way, and led us to take us a situation where we take big advantage of economies of scale. Uh, so policies have been important here, I think they're less important now that the costs have come down. These energy these sectors can probably support themselves competitively, but they wouldn't have got here without major investments in, in policies over the last couple of decades. Transportation. Um, that unfortunately is nothing like such a, uh, an encouraging story. And I can, Michael indicated this in his slides also. Um, this is a, the stock, this is, the bar chart shows you the total stock of electric vehicles in the world by year. It's roughly seven and a half million at the moment. At least, sorry, at the end of 2019, it was roughly seven and a half million. So the IEA data. Um, that's a trivial fraction of the hundreds of millions of vehicles on the roads globally. Uh, so we really haven't made very much progress here. This is the, the continuous line here is the, the, the sale rate of vehicles. And toward the end of 2019, electric vehicles were selling at about four and a half million per year globally. Again, a very, very low figure by comparison to the total sales of internal combustion engine vehicles globally. Uh, so we have a very long way to go indeed before we have a significant presence of electric vehicles. This is a, a forecast. It's a, a forecast probably as an overstatement. It's a guess. Could be a more accurate statement by Deloitte, um, one of many people who, one of many groups have made estimates in this sort of area, guessing that um, by 2030, the end of this decade, uh, electric vehicles will constitute roughly 30% of total new vehicle sales worldwide. Um, California. Currently, the sales of electric vehicles are running around about 8%. Um, that's actually, that's referred to 2018, so they're slightly above that now. In some other countries, they're higher than this. For example, uh, Norway sales of electric vehicles are running about 25%. And some other European countries, they're running around about 10%. So electric vehicles are beginning to take off right now. But you now the fraction of the stock of vehicles, which is electric, is, is, is unfortunately trivial. and will remain that way for quite, quite some time. Uh, so we need to make much more progress in the field of electrification of transportation. Um, the relevant policies here, obviously, are the CAFE standards in the US. There's an equivalent in the European Union, uh, almost exactly equivalent to the CAFE standard here. And then, of course, direct subsidies. Subsidies to the installation of charging infrastructure and subsidies to the sale of electric vehicles. Uh, one of the reasons, for example, that Norway has 25% of EV sales, 25% of new vehicle sales being EVs, is they have absolutely massive subsidies, far bigger than we've ever had here, uh, to the sale of electric vehicles. Um, so currently, uh, we need subsidies. We need uh, either directly uh, through subsidies to sales or indirectly through things like the CAFE standards and their equivalent to make progress for electric vehicles. Heating. Uh, picture here is even less in encouraging, unfortunately. This gives you a breakdown of the sales of heating equipment uh, worldwide. 60% uh, of sales, roughly speaking, are on fossil fuel based equipment. 20%, roughly speaking, are electrical equipment, meaning we're using resistive electrical methods to generate heat. You've got a small fraction here, heat pumps, 
which is the direction we really need to be going in, district heating, uh, and then hydrogen heating up here, surprisingly large fraction action. Um, what we have to do essentially is to phase out, sorry about that, is phase out this piece of, uh, of uh, uh, fossil fuel based equipment down here, replace it by either electrical equipment or heat pumps. Electrical equipment uh, is fine, of course, provided that the electricity comes from renewable energy or from nuclear power or from hydropower, provided it doesn't come from fossil fuels. Um, at the moment, there's, this, the, the right-hand side of this diagram is what the IEA would like to happen. It doesn't in any sense represent a serious forecast of what will happen. Um, at the moment, there's very little progress towards, uh, towards phasing out fossil fuel-based equipment. Um, and there's really no policies that are trying to do this either. Um, there's one exception, which is here in New York City, we have a thing called Local Law 97, which is a very aggressive piece of legislation, uh, which puts a tax on the emission of carbon dioxide by buildings. Each building is allowed to have a certain amount of CO2 per square foot emitted. And anything over the prescribed amount is, uh, there's a fine of $250 per ton of CO2 emitted. It's a very, very steep law, very, very aggressive law. Um, it's being phased in right now and will be phased in fully by 2025. Um, but I'm not aware of anything else like that anywhere else. Uh, carbon taxes, if implemented, obviously would be relevant here. Building codes, much tighter building codes, cap and trade system. Uh, again, all of these could make could, could have some impact on emissions from buildings uh, and emissions from heating systems. Uh, but to date, I have to say there's very little progress about this. And, and not just is there very little progress on this, but there's really, it's a problem which is really out of sight. Uh, people talk about uh, decarbonizing the electricity system. They talk about decarbonizing transportation. So those at least are on the radar screen. This problem is really not even on the radar screen and it needs a great deal more attention. Uh, as I, you, I showed you in that pie chart, the, first, on the second slide, uh, this is the second biggest source of CO2 emissions in the United States. Uh, okay, final comments. This is my last slide. Uh, how effective is a carbon tax? A lot of, I've mentioned carbon taxes several times. This is a diagram which comes from a paper that Wolfram Schlenker and I wrote last year. Um, shows you on the horizontal axis, the desired reduction in oil use uh, cumulative oil use in terms of percent, going from 0 to 60% on this diagram. And here it shows you the carbon tax you need to affect that. So for example, we wanted to reduce cumulative oil use by 50%. Uh, we would have to have a carbon tax of roughly $550 per ton of CO2 emitted. Uh, that's a very steep carbon tax, very steep indeed. That's roughly five and a half dollars per gallon of gasoline, for example to push the price of gasoline up enormously and probably far more than is politically acceptable here in the US and in most other countries too. Um, so um, the, 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 I, I haven't really got time to go into the, the math behind these, these arguments here, but the argument is that the, if you take into account this exhaustible resource nature of oil um, and the fact that stocks of oil remain in the ground if they're not used, uh, then this makes carbon taxes far less efficient than many people have thought. I and mean, we have to have a much higher carbon tax. And it's just to me that we need to think of alternative to carbon taxes. Final point I want to make is that decarbonization implies electrification. Uh, if we get rid of carbon dioxide from vehicles, we, we're, we're using electric vehicles. If we get, carbon, get rid of carbon dioxide from buildings and from heating system, we're using electrical heating one way or another. So we have to think very carefully about pricing electricity. Uh, when we're trying to persuade people to move from carbon, from fossil fuels to electricity. Um, we need to think about setting prices close to marginal cost to get the right kind of signal here. And remember, if we're using largely renewable energy or even large nuclear energy for that matter, the marginal cost will be, will be very low indeed. Um, so we need to think about how we're gonna manage an electricity system where prices are low uh, in order to provide the right incentives to switch from fossil fuels to electricity. Uh, but there will be fixed costs which are probably not covered by those low prices. A classic Dupree Bridge problem. Okay, that's the end. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, and last but certainly not least, we have Bill, who I think, uh, Bill Nordhaus, who I think might have been unprepared to talk about 50,000 acre sheep farms, but we will find out in due course. Okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, Michael. And it's, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I want to thank the ASSA, in particular the AEA, for their organization of these meetings. It's, um, it's a wonderful organization and that to be able to put this on 
in the middle of online around the world is a great accomplishment to Peter Russo and the AA staff, and I'd like to compliment them. Uh, I also like to thank my, my um, other participants in this panel. I've learned a lot um, already in this that I didn't know, and I'm sure the, the participants have as well. I'd, I'd like to talk about what, primarily about international climate architecture. Um, but I'm going to have, have to lead up with that with a number of comments that complement what the other panelists have said, but you really can't talk about architecture without talking about where we are. So let me give some introductory comments. So I think the key issues that all of us are addressing today uh, would be something like the following, except perhaps to the last one. Uh, one is there's, there's been little progress in slowing emissions uh, uh, across the world, if you look at the <laughs> overall trends. Uh, some places are more positive than others. Um, then I want to point to two key, key economic insights. Uh, one is, and this has been emphasized considerably today, uh, the importance of incentives for low carbon technologies. <clears throat> and then I'll talk a little bit about the landscape on carbon pricing, uh, which has come up in all three of the present uh, discussions too far. And then I want to uh, end with an emphasis on the flawed architecture of climate agreements how they promote free riding. But I just want to remind myself and remind all of us that uh, climate change is a global public good. And this is the most challenging and vexing of all political economic problems. You couldn't find a tougher problem. If you want, if you want to pick one you want to spend your life solving, um, we haven't done very well on, with the exception of the chlorofluorocarbons, whether it's nuclear proliferation, public health, name it, name it the law of the sea, uh, this is this is an area that's full of uh, flawed agreements and dead ends, and this is another one. Um, so uh, first, let me talk about uh, the. What I'd like to show is a picture of uh, the trend in the CO two GDP <laughs> CO two GDP ratio, which is uh, trends in decarbonization. So I think this is if I were to look at a single indicator. Uh, where we are in emissions, this is one I'd look at. I'd look at in different countries as well, but um, since our time is not uh, allowed that, I'm just gonna show one picture, which is the global trend. And this is over the period since 1970 through 2019. I think the data after 2019 are gonna be so muddled that uh, it's gonna be th two or three years before they're useful. But what you can see here is the trend. We are in a downtrend uh, of about one and a half percent per year since 1970. Uh, there's been a little bit of a, uh, an acceleration of the trend or deceleration in the trend in the last five or six years, but it's nowhere near enough to meet our goals, as I'll show in the next slide. Uh, and I think uh, it's not clear why this, this slight deceleration has occurred, but it, it's, it's certainly hardening, but it's nowhere near enough. Um, so I think the first picture is we, we're, really, we're really not making a lot of progress on the key goal of decarbonization, which is one that Jeff Heal emphasized in his presentation. Uh, this shows, um, this shows the, um, uh, what we need to get to our climate goals. Uh, if you take the two degrees C as the uh, target goal, roughly lead, that's uh, zero net emissions by the middle of the century. Uh, this shows the last, uh, over in the left here, the decarbonization from 1990 to 2019. Uh, it shows in the red here, the projections of modelers uh, of what the decarbonization will look like in the, uh, under the Paris Accord through 2030. And th this is a little out of date, does not include um, the pandemic, but I, I'm just assuming we're gonna be back to trend in two or three years, uh, both on the economy and emissions. Uh, and then the screen line is what we're gonna need to do to get to uh, the two degree target. And there's this, the main point is there's a, for lots of reasons, there's a big disconnect between even our goals in the Paris Accord, and I won't talk about whether we're meeting them or not, our goals in the Paris Accord and the target aspirations of the Paris Accord, um, they're just very, very far apart. Okay, so I wanna talk about uh, three economic insights that come out of the, um, the work to date um, and uh, the, the thing I want to, um, 
add today that I, I think uh, I want to spend a little more emphasis on today than, uh, than some other talks uh, we've had or on technology. So I would say the key economic insight here, uh, number one, is the inadequate incentives for low carbon technologies. Now, one of the key findings in, in innovation theory and, and history is that the public returns on innovation are many times larger than the private returns. And this is particularly true at the um, end, of, uh, end of the spectrum that's basic research and fundamental research. Um, it's still true, a large, very large factor in applied research and development. Uh, but even if you get down to production and we think of production, there are externalities in production through learning curves, um, and uh, which we're seeing particularly today in wind power, which is just a, a, a really a great case of economies of scale through uh, learning curves. Um, but the main thing is that we have this public returns being far hard, larger than the private returns. But one of the things that I think is not sufficiently um, uh, understood is or appreciated is that this is worsened by the, what I call a double externality for low carbon innovations, because low carbon innovations face, face an externality, the normal externality of innovation, the, the uh, gap between public and private returns, but also there's a gap because of mispricing. So if you do innovations for low carbon technologies in most economies around the world today, you're gonna to be uh, in the private sector we're talking, you're gonna be doing innovations where you're looking at the returns, but the returns are underpriced because the price on carbon is so far below the, the, uh, the social cost of carbon. So uh, coming back to that concept. So if, the, if you, you do an innovation, not only do not capture because you can't appropriate the returns, but even those that you can appropriate are vastly underpriced because of the underpricing of CO2 emissions. So this is something we, we need to really think about in this part of the economic, which is the technological change, low carbon innovation, we need to think about how to solve this uh, double externality. Now, I, I think one of the things we really need to think about is the uh, need for a major increase in public policies for low carbon energy. Now, we, we uh, Jeff talked about what I call the production externalities and the learning curve externalities, but I wanna go upstream to the R&D externalities, basic research, fundamental research, applied research and development. One way, if I could just ask everybody to think a minute, if you thought of what the priorities are for research and development in say the military versus the priorities in energy, whether it's energy or low carbon, uh, just ponder a minute where, where you think the priorities lie, where we should we be putting our public funds for research and development, our public expenditures, whether it's through direct subsidies or tax subsidies or, su or supporting not-for-profits and universities and so on. If you just think about that for a minute, and that, well, not too many minutes, but just a minute. But I, I, I hadn't really looked at that until preparing, but here's a picture. Uh, this shows you federal research and development in the United States for the military and that includes both the Defense Department, nuclear weapons, and nuclear security. Uh, it doesn't include some of the other things like Homeland Security and cybersecurity and so on. It's basically the standard defense. And that's about $60 billion a year in 2018. And then if you go to look at federal support for um, what I'll call just sort of green energy, and that would be there's a thing called ARPA-E, which is um, Advanced Research and Development Association for Energy. And then there's Energy Department Support for Renewables. And it's about $2 billion a year. If you just look at that graph, I would say it's really shocking if you think of the misalignment of our federal expenditures in R&D with the, our national and social priorities. It's really astounding. So I th I'd say one of the things that we as economists should think about very carefully is, and, and uh, in our public policies also is how to balance the public support for uh, research and development, maybe expenditures more generally, but particularly research and development. And there's another feature here that's, that if you think about it, the energy research and development has big positive spillovers around the world for our goals, 
because they help other, I mean, it helps other countries that can't afford the kind of R&D expenditures the U.S. can. Whereas military, I, I won't get into that, but the military is a kind of negative. I mean, the, the energy is in a positive sum. And then we're building weapons. And then in about five years, we're going to build these, have, have the new weapons and somebody else will have them and it'll negate the research and development. So these are the, the game theoretic structure of these kinds of research and development are also completely different. Okay, so that's that's one thing. I just want to emphasize that I'm going to spend more on this today because I think we we've, we've been maybe I personally, but I think maybe also we have been spending more time with worrying about the carbon tax and carbon pricing, and less time than we should on the support for um, for uh, new technology. I think Jeff Jeff Heal did a little bit of uh, uh, work on that that I think has been very very important. Uh, all right, so the second point, I'm gonna be more brief here, but um, just I wanna remind the other key economic insight is the importance of harmonized carbon prices uh, to, and for sharp uh, emissions reductions. And I, I have a little different perspective on this than, than Jeff does, but um, I think particularly if you look not at oil, but at coal uh, and um, as a, a place to, to apply carbon prices and also perhaps for, areas that are outside the standard ones, particularly the ones he emphasizes like housing and structures and commercial and industrial. But the fact is that carbon prices today are fragmented around the world and in our countries. They're low and they're modeled by subsidies. And I'll just show one picture here that um, uh, about on this, which is, uh, so if you think of carbon taxes and subsidies in 2019, so if you look at the dollars per ton, uh, Michael mentioned this earlier, and I, these are basically from the World Bank, that if you take all the carbon prices from cap and trade and carbon taxes and divide them, all the revenues and divide them by all the emissions, it's about $2 a ton. It's a little under that, but that roughly that. But then you look at fossil subsidies, and these are from, these are from the World Bank and the IMF, uh, they're about $10 a ton. Uh, they're, they're, they're all over the place. They're just vast, vast numbers of subsidies. So the subsidies far outpace the, the uh, carbon prices today. Um, now, the, it is true that the fossil subsidies have been going down over the last decade, so that's good news. Uh, they've gone down more than the carbon prices have gone up, so that's, I suppose, good news uh, as well. I would also mention there are two other things which, uh, interestingly, are not measured, and this is a big I would just say this is a very important item on the agenda of the World Bank who, who measures this, which is to, to estimate the impact of uh, the, the carbon price equivalent of the feed-in tariffs mm -hmm. that are particularly important in Europe and some of the US states and the carbon tax equivalents uh, or the carbon price equivalents of regulations. And um, there's been a little work on the carbon price equivalent of feed-in tariffs. My guess would be it's a couple dollars uh, but it's a kind of model calculation. And regulations, I just have no idea. I mean, it's probably that order of magnitude around the world. But that's a very important because for the U.S., most of the impacts are carbon price equivalents are regulations. Maybe a little bit of feed-in tariffs as well. Uh, I'm just, I'm not, I'm just going to, I just want to show this briefly. This is the carbon price landscape, and it's too complicated to explain, except to say that if you just look at the effective carbon prices by countries, they go from about $51 in Sweden to zero in 80% in of the world. And this is where the, one point, the $2 a ton comes from. Uh, but the landscape, this is why I said when the landscape is highly fragmented, both in terms of the price and the percentage of regions that are covered by, it's just, it's, it's just a complete um, chaotic uh, situation. Now, final, point I want to make, I'll be brief here, but um, I've talked about this in this, uh, at this association before, but I think the other thing, I do believe that after 30 years, our international climate policy is a dead end because the policy architecture uh, has not respected the fact that there's a big free rider problem in international agreements. And uh, this is based on um, not just looking at, at the carbon prices today, the virtual emissions reductions. It's also looking at the incentive structure that these are voluntary agreements with no incentives to participate. It's looked at the history. It's looked at very important work by Scott Barrett 
on international environmental agreements and on free riding. So I think basically, I, I do think we're at a dead end on international agreements. And it's not a surprise that the uh, international landscape is so fragmented because the, the agreement structure is so rife with free riding. Um, and I'll just mention briefly um, that there's another approach which I have, uh, I'm not alone, but others have estimated as well, which is what I'll call a climate, climate compact or climate club. And um, the ba basic point about a climate compact or club uh, is that it's a different structure of international agreements, one where there are both obligations and penalties. So it's, it's like a club where you, you get, there's a, there's a uh, global public good in this case, um, you need to get uh, countries to participate and, and invest, but there has to be incentives for participation and those would be some kind of penalties for non-participation. And one model have these features would be uh, international regime with a target, target carbon price, say $50 per ton of CO2, and then a penalty tariff on non-participants, say 3% uniform penalty tariff. And some modeling that has been done uh, I've done some, Scott Barrett has done some with the co-authors, shows that this could be effective, limited in fact, and not completely effective in combating free riding. And I'll just show you, uh, this, this, this is what I call a carbon price Laffer curve, which on the horizontal axis shows the, a target carbon price. And then on the vertical axis shows the global emissions reductions. And the three curves show what the carbon Laffer price, carbon Laffer curve would look like for different tariff structures. The one on the left being with basically, you can get, there, there's some interest in countries having carbon prices just because of local uh, uh, impacts. But you can see that for higher and higher tariff, penalty tariffs, you can get higher and higher supported carbon taxes, but you can't get very, very high ones because of the, you've got to rely on linkage to other agreements to make these agreements uh, take hold. Okay, so I'll just summarize. So uh, I think one of the key points I wanna make is that the climate architecture we have today is ineffective, international climate architecture, because of the fact that these are voluntary agreements and therefore they promote free riding. Then uh, the, um, the other emphasis would be today, I'd like to just mention that we really need to think much care more carefully about the double externality of low carbon technologies and uh, really work on thinking of the most effective ways to promote those. Okay, so I think I will wrap up there and thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. That was uh, terrific from <clears throat> all three of you. So uh, I think I would now like to try and start a conversation and I put together a few questions. And so the first question uh, that I wondered if we could all take on uh, it is uh, whether climate change has moved beyond, is, is it beyond economics and cost benefit analysis and has it become uh, a moral issue? Uh, and I think uh, when we talk to our friends who are inside economics sometimes and even, uh, and certainly friends outside of economics, there's a sense that this is no longer an issue that should be talked about uh, where you try to tally the costs and the benefits. Uh, and we just got to get doing and get to zero tomorrow. Uh, so I wanted to see if any of you wanted to react to that. And I thought Maureen, given her presentation in particular, might have some views, but uh, I'd love to hear from everyone. Well, I'll, I'll kick things off. Um, I mean, one of the points I was making is that there are climate targets which people do talk about, I mean, getting to net zero carbon emissions for the U.S., for example, by 2050, which, let's face it, is perhaps, it has a lot of appeal, I can see, in, in many ways. Um, in terms of you know, how something like that is chosen and the fact that costs and benefits aren't balanced, I think, is, is a problem. Um, in terms, I mean, you were also going to ask me, I think, about the issue of how climate damages matter and what, I mean, I didn't fully answer this question of what do they imply for climate policy. So one thing that I do think has happened, and I think you hinted at it in your talk, Michael, is that if you look at damage functions, um, they have been moving upward, okay, where uh, dollars are on the vertical axis and temperature on the, on the horizontal. 
And if you think about, um, you know, what would happen if, if you put these functions and people have, including Bill, um, into a model where you're balancing costs and damages or benefits of reduction, they really would call for significant carbon taxes. Um, and I think that that's something that should be discussed and emphasized. I think that there's been a lot of poo-pooing the notion of doing that and uh, really emphasizing much more, uh, how shall I put it, other kinds of targets. Um, so I will, I will pass the baton to my fellow panelists. Yeah, I think Jeff, are you raising your hand? Or yeah, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting question. Um, my reaction is that it's always been an ethical issue because then the discussions we've been having about the discount rate going right back into the sort of 80s and 90s it really mean that we've been talking about you know this, our sense of what our obligations to future generations are. And the discount rate has always been seen as a way of sort of balancing obligations to present versus future. And you know, clearly an important dimension of this is that it extends far into the, this problem is that the consequences extend far into the future and so that we're making decisions today which will affect future people. So I think there's always been a strong element of, of ethics or morality in at least a part of the debate uh, here. I think that you know, maybe part of the question is whether the problem has become so, so compelling and so urgent that in some sense it overrides economics the economic considerations um, that maybe what people are getting at when they say this. Um, but that, you know, that statement is still an economic statement, I think. It's a statement, it's really a statement just that the costs and benefit, the costs are potentially so large and the risks are so large uh, that um, they outweigh any, any reasonable estimate of the costs of taking action. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Um, uh, but I mean, that, that, that could be one interpretation of the idea that uh, but this is this is the problem now is dominated by ethics rather than economics. Yeah, Bill, please. I think I mean I I would just use the word values rather than moral. I think this is a this is an issue that has very deep values. Uh, it has ones as Jeff mentioned that uh, involve sort of interpersonal and intergenerational transfers and. Uh, so, I mean, we have this generation doing things that are going to affect other generations and other generations in different parts of the world, maybe unborn, who have no uh, say in what we're doing. So I think that's, that's a deep value issue, a deep political issue. So maybe much more so than most anything we do outside of wartime. Um, and then the other thing which is, uh, makes this a difficult value uh, issue is that so much of the effects are ones that take place outside of the marketplace. So they, they require, I mean, for example, in the work you've done on the uh, effect on health and human life, uh, Michael, uh, those are things that are, uh, are ones that really, they do get into morality and religion, uh, as well as uh, very, very difficult valuation issues. So in that sense, it's, it's, it's got it in addition to the public goods issue, it has this deep valuation issue and transfer issues and equity issues that, that complicate it. Can I just add one point, Michael, which is that um, the dimension of the damages of climate change, which is not heavily emphasized, is the extinction of species. You know, various IPCC reports uh, sort of forecast that you know, 20, 30, 40% of the species on Earth might be extinct under RCP 8.5 by the end of the century. And that raises issue of ethical questions. You know, what, what right do we have to, to, to drive species to extinction? What obligations do we have to maintain species with which we share the earth? These are also very complex issues. They haven't really got enough attention, I think, so far, but I mean, they're, they're certainly coming to the issue of values issues of a rather deep type that Bill was talking about. Yeah, so, you know, one thing I'd be interested in hearing from all of you, or any of you who feel so moved uh, is, there's no question that there's a, this is an issue, uh, issue of values and trade-offs between, uh, you know, to put it, as one of you put bluntly, you know, people who are not even born yet and our consumption today. And that is, you know, cause for pause, certainly. Uh, but does it, and is, does that necessarily mean cost-benefit analysis can't be part of this, of the way of, of approaching climate change? And I think Maureen made a pretty impassioned case for it. Uh, and 
I sometimes feel that the conversation be, by raising, you know, I, when uh, I was involved in setting the U.S. government social cost of carbon, there was always a flavor in those discussions inside the White House of naming things that we couldn't value or didn't have very, uh, you know, well-established ways to value, almost as if to bring in, well, those things are infinite since we can't value them. Uh, and so now we can stop talking about uh, cost-benefit analysis. And I, I find it personally a very difficult component or feature of talking about climate change. And I wonder if that generates reactions from any of you. It's, these are very complex issues. Um, I mean, to pursue the issue of biodiversity again, I mean, there's no question that one of the biggest consequences of climate change, of unbright, un, un, unlimited climate change, will be but, you know, the composition of the natural world around us, and what we see, you know, sort of, um, and that's something which is very hard to evaluate, uh, that consequence. I mean, there's, it has both, it seems to me it has both utilitarian and, and sort of ethical dimensions to it, in the sense that, you know, we, we depend upon the natural world in a lot of ways, so destroying parts of the natural world will certainly have an impact on us. I mean, think of the destruction of forests in the Western US, for example, I mean, there's, there's a, does have a sort of recreational value, so there's a utilitarian value to the human population, uh, utilitarian cost of losing those. At the same time, there's also, I think, a, 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 a value, an ethical dimension of the destruction of all of the, the living be beings in those forests, um, which is much harder to get your hands around, obviously. Um, <clears throat> doesn't mean it has no value and it doesn't mean it has infinite value either um, and but to some extent things like um, contingent valuation studies try to get hold of the value that people place on these although I have a lot of limitations and a lot of reservations about how well they do that uh, but I think we, we, we can recognize that these things exist even if we can't put a number on them. Could I, I mean I, I, if I could just say I think part of the problem is when people think of cost-benefit analysis they think of just adding up the numbers um, adding, just add them up, sort of like a, a vast utilitarian calculus. But if you think of what cost-benefit analysis is, is at its heart, it's, it's basically impacts, negative and positive, on different people in different areas, uh, different generations. And it's, it's a huge matrix, or at least vector, of impacts, negative and positive, on different people um, and maybe different species or different individ and individual species and species as a whole. And the, the, objection is, the objections are two. One is to monetize those. So you could have a vector of health effects, but one objection is, do you want to monetize that? Or do you want to monetize the, the species? And then the other objective is, objection would be, well, once you've monetized, you know, just add them up, you know, put a discount rate on things in the future, add up the different countries. And so if we go back a step and say, okay, look, instead of looking at this grand sum of all people and all animals and all human lives and all time and discounted to get one big number, uh, look at it, just don't, just leave it a little more unpacked. Uh, and it, it, it doesn't give you a clear way to do a calculus for maximization, but it gives you a way of looking at it. So I think in any case, well, at least for me as, an, as, a, as a social scientist, I won't say economist, social scientist, um, I, I think the looking at impact analysis, that's impacts positive and negative on different parts of the world and different people and maybe different species as well, is absolutely critical. I don't know, how would you support a two degree target if you didn't say, this is doing too much damage to here, here, and here, um, uh, and it's unacceptable. I, I, that's the only way I could think of doing that in a reasoned, ethical way. Okay, I'm gonna use that. This is uh, fascinating. Uh, and I'm gonna go a little bit out of order in what I planned. And because I think what is striking, one of the features of climate change is so striking to me is the heterogeneity in the impacts uh, and you could even do it the heterogeneity across species or the heterogeneity across people or different parts of the world. Uh, so uh, suppose it's January 21st, 2021, uh, the day after Biden is inaugurated as president and you've been appointed climate czar, not for the United States of America, uh, 
but for pick your favorite or all of China, India, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and these, as I tried to emphasize in my talk, these are countries where I think the trade-offs look very different. They look complicated in the United States for sure, but I think those trade-offs look even more complicated uh, in, in, in those countries. Uh, what would you advise the leaders of those countries to do? Well, I'll, I'll take a crack at India, um, where I worked as you have, Michael. I mean, if, if you look at both, um, I guess, sectors that are generating carbon emissions, but also have huge co-benefits, co health co-benefits from re reducing reliance on fossil fuels, I would first of all actually start with the burning of solid fuels for cooking and, and home heating. Um, these are a huge, huge source of uh, fine particle pollution in India, in the north of India especially, in central India. Um, they're also generating uh, carbon emissions. Certainly the Indian government has been trying to take steps to get people onto cleaner fuels. Um, this is a very hard uh, nut to crack. Um, whether there could be, in some sense, subsidies given um, from other countries for that matter. I mean, for, the, for actually making progress on this front, I'm not sure, but I think this is something, this is an area that I would really first tackle because it really, it's contributing to something like 30 to 40% of fine particles in parts of India. And the other area that I would really emphasize is, is using coal to generate electricity. Um, there, the Indian government has really made pledges for renewables, but I will be giving a paper tomorrow to talk about actually the carbon impacts and the health impacts of the 100 gigawatts of coal-fired power plants that are actually in the planning stages in India. So there's currently about 200 gigawatts, and in the planning stages, there's another 100 gigawatts. When you look at both the health impacts of those and for that matter, the health impacts of the current stock of plants, they're huge. Um, you know, we were talking about the fact that implicitly there is subsidy to fossil fuels because you're not taxing the externalities and that's certainly something that's happening in India. So I would, I would use this as perhaps arguments for greater subsidies to renewables in the case of, um, in the case of electricity. Um, but I think that health code benefits are a big issue. They're certainly something that both the World Bank and the IMF have put a lot of emphasis on. Um, and I think that they are something that at least should be discussed. I don't know to what extent, how shall I say it, um, they actually will influence policy on the ground. Jeff or Bill? Uh... Thank you, Maureen. That was a terrific insight. Terrific insight. My thoughts were very much the same as Maureen's, um, that, that the co-benefits are much bigger in some of these countries than here in the US. And so I think that politically, that's an important part in selling the idea of renewable energy. I just make one small comment about India. I did a little bit of work on the progress of renewable energy in India. One of the things I discovered there was that uh, a lot of Indian utilities or electricity distributors either own coal mines or are, co are owned by entities that also own coal mines. And as a result of that, they frequently distribute coal-fired electricity in preference to renewable electricity, even though the marginal cost is much, much higher. And that's something which clearly needs intervention. And, they, and I think it's crucial that uh, in India, some of these entities distribute to divest themselves with their coal mines in order to get a, a level playing field in the, in, the, in the power market there. But I'll just note that I, if I read, if I understand both of you, uh, neither of you think that, uh, maybe I'm putting unfair words in your mouth, that climate change in and of itself uh, w would or should have much traction, uh, except as a, uh, through the means of uh, health, health effects of air, uh, local air pollution in India. I think, in, no, that, that, I, I, yeah, thanks for raising the point. I mean, I think India is obviously very vulnerable to climate change, both through fluctuations in the monsoon, um, uh, which is a you know, key part of the agricultural system, also potentially uh, drop in the, the volume of flow in some of the big rivers, given the melting of, uh, of uh, glaciers in the Tibetan Plateau. And finally, I mean, the, um, 
the, uh, there have been several studies that suggest that parts of India could experience temperatures which are sort of outside the, the, uh, the bearable range. We have wet bulb temperatures over 95 degrees in parts of India sometime in the next few decades, maybe even even shorter, shorter timetable than that. I mean, the, the point there is, is, I guess, many people know is that there are temperatures, temperature humidity combinations above which human, humans cannot survive. And some of those temperature humidity combinations are forecast for parts of India uh, over the next few decades. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. So it's not often that the American Economic Association meetings that we're asked to uh, fantasize, but since you have, I will. Um, what I would do is I would, um, I would ask Secretary Kerry for a half day of his time, and I would get a panel of people together, that this one would be as good as any, uh, better than most, better than any maybe, and uh, say, look, you need to devote, you need to devote the kind of energy uh, you did on this that you did to the Iraq agreement, the Iran agreement. This needs careful structured agreements uh, with both sides contributing. And you need, instead of getting 200 countries together, you need to get a half a dozen of the major countries together. You need to meet with them. Um, and you need to persuade them that it is in their interests, their long run interests, and maybe even their short run interests. Uh, well, let's say in their short run interests as well as long run interests to take strong policies as soon as possible. And then you'd, you'd point out the risks, not just the risks of heat, the risks of tropical diseases, the risks of pandemics which are born in these uh, circumstances, the risks of monsoon, the risks of agricultural risks, the risks of conflict, all, all the different things. You could just, you don't have to even exaggerate. You just point out all the things that have been found and say, and this is something that can only be solved if the five, six, seven, eight of us get together and take concerted action. And we need to do it in a way where we're really uh, serious about it. And we set up a structure where we really uh, guarantee that we're gonna do it with both incentives and uh, with incentive structure. So that, that's, and then uh, after a half a day of that, uh, Kerry's a very seasoned diplomat. He's done many good things and I would set him loose on this. Uh, but I think he needs, since he's got a kind of, I mean, I, the thing I worry about the administration, it's, it's, it's kind of Paris, it's, you know, bring Paris back, okay? Paris is burned and I just rebuild it. Uh, but I think that's not the right model, as I said earlier. So you need to actually, you need to have uh, some se serious discussion about how to rebuild the rebuild the, the architecture of the climate agreements. Let me second that. I've I've also argued that uh, um, you know eighty percent of CO two emissions come from six or seven countries, and those are the ones you really need to get involved in an agreement. Um, and, and if they do the right thing, then the problem is largely solved, and the rest will probably follow along anyway. Um, so I think that, that, that's a very good idea, and I think it's a crucial, a crucial thing to try to focus on, you know, Euro, Europe, the US, China, um, India, and a couple more countries. You know, I just add to amplify some of the points that have been made here. Uh, I think uh, oftentimes, I, I think the case for local benefits uh, from action in places outside of the United States are, is actually uh, much stronger than people realize. Uh, you know, India is a really perfect example. It is so poorly positioned with respect to its existing climate. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, there'll be parts of India that I think will be close to uninhabitable. Uh, the average person in India is losing about five years of life expectancy uh, due to uh, conventional air pollution currently, at least according uh, to my research. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I think fossil fuels are really, uh, they're a problem today and uh, tomorrow for India and for many other parts of the world. A lot of developing countries are very vulnerable to sea level rise as well, Mike. Yeah, sea level rise. Yeah. You as well. If you've ever been to Mumbai, you can feel the water. <laughs> it's not far. Uh, so then, you know, I'll just twist the question a little bit. You know, suppose you were the US climate advisor. Uh, is there anything you want to add or have we covered it already? I was going to ask my fellow panelists if they were able to set a carbon tax for the U.S., the level at which they would initially set it. 
I'm, I'm not the expert on this topic at all. So I think that's an interesting question. Well, picking up a point that Bill made in kind of response to my comments, I mean, I, I, Bill, you're quite right, Bill, that um, I was focusing entirely on oil when I talked about carbon tax. Carbon tax, much lower than the ones I was talking about, would have a huge impact on coal uh, and, and also on gas as well, actually. Um, so that the, 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 the coal and gas on the one hand and oil on the other hand pose rather different problems because there's, there's so few alternatives to oil in like most of its current uses. I mean, the elasticity of demand for oil is very, very low, as we all know, whereas the elasticity of demand for some of the other fuels is much higher, um, which is why it breaks out separately. So you could certainly use a carbon tax and ha expect to have that have a big impact on the use of coal and gas. Uh, but I think you have to find some other ways of encouraging people to switch away from oil, which would primarily be in transportation and in heating, obviously. Um, and I think that uh, you know, some other, other, other policies, the sort of policy that Bill was talking about in terms of subsidies and encouraging R&D and so on, uh, supply side policies, loosely speaking, uh, what are called for in those areas. Can I just say that? I, I, as I was looking back and thinking about this session that what economists say versus what engineers say, technologists, physicists, climatologists, um, I think economists may perhaps spend too much time delivering talking about the unpleasant medicine rather than the, the pleasant ones. So we, we do spend a lot of time talking about, well, maybe, maybe this is my own bias, but I think we spend a lot of time talking about uh, carbon taxes or cap and trade and different regimes. And uh, whereas the physicists talk about, uh, uh, and, the, about let's, and the engineers, let's, let's get these new technologies, let's support uh, wind and solar and geothermal and even fusion. And, uh, and that's something that re I think resonates with people much more than taxes. So I, I, think we need to, I, I think we need to change our message a little bit to say it's really two things. And um, the idea of supporting new technologies and green technologies, I, I've, never, I've never tested this in a, in a focus group or a survey, but I, I am sure that that resonates very, very deeply with people and people who might be uh, sort of a, a little ambivalent about, well, I, I like the idea of, of pricing carbon because it's gonna get where I want, but on the other hand, I'm struggling now, but they're not gonna have that feeling about, about um, supporting low carbon technologies and all across the spectrum for fundamental research on say battery technologies and, and materials technologies, all the way to giant, giant wind, turbines and so on. So, I, and the other thing, I, just one other point, which Michael didn't emphasize this, but I think your, your, your presentation did in my mind is that we have this, and, and Jeff as well, we have this massive, massive, if we're gonna go there to anything like a two degree target, we have a massive change in our infrastructures that can be needed. Not just the gas stations have to become, I mean, we, we don't want gasoline stations anymore. I don't know what they are called but uh, we have to replace those with the, with the new generation of infrastructure and not just the technologies of the electric cars, but the, the infrastructure that goes along with it. And, uh, and so that, that, that's gonna require massive, massive change in our structure. And we can't do that without new technologies. So they, we really, really got to think about the technologies we're, that we, we want to have in place in 2050 uh, and how we're going to get there and not just think about them and dream about them and fantasize them, but what kind of actual policies are going to get us from here to there. But wouldn't you also still want to have a carbon tax? And don't you think that how people would react to it depends on what you do with the revenues? Well, of course, you, you, of course you would want both. But I think, um, I, think I would... Uh, I would put them, I would pair them together and I might even pair them together politically in terms of using one to support the other. Uh, as much as economists hate earmark things, maybe this is a place where earmarks would be ideal. Um, there's a question uh, from the audience that seems relevant that I'll just insert here. Uh, Developing countries, this is from uh, Farhad Amin, De developing countries often say that the problem was initially caused by rich countries while they industrialize. Uh, so in that hypothetical meeting between John Kerry and the five to seven countries, should the U.S. commit to subsidizing India and others heavily?
How about yes? <laughs> uh, yes, that's. Uh, I think we probably all feel that way, but uh, it is seems challenging politically. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think part of what we do, <clears throat> something that Bill alluded to before, is we develop new technologies <clears throat> and we make those available. <clears throat> that's a form yeah, of I think that's a that's an easier way to subsidize. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, okay. I, one, uh, you know, I do love, uh, Donald Rumsfeld had all these wonderful quotes, uh, former Secretary of Defense, twice actually, uh, his Secretary of Defense. He said, uh, as we know, there are known knowns, there are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns, that is to say, we know there are some things we do not know, uh, but there are also unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know we don't know. Uh, would each of you speculate a little bit on what are the known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns when it comes to climate change? And Jeff, I know you've touched a little bit about this with respect to biodiversity, but if you wanted to expand on this, and of course, I'd be interested in uh, what Maureen and Bill think as, as well. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> we just don't know an awful lot about what the consequences are of large-scale extinction of other species. <clears throat> um, I mean, the pandemic, you, know, you alluded to the fact that uh, the pandemic is partly generated by sort of human impact on the environment um, through you know, making it e easier to transfer infection between species. Um, we have nowhere, that's something which I think no one would really have anticipated as little as 25 years ago. Um, and I think that there may well be other um, consequences of human impact on sort of natural environment and other species which we really don't understand at the moment, and really haven't even thought of. Um, so I, th I think that one of the most under-researched areas in this whole field is the consequence of large-scale biodiversity loss. Now we've got some pointers there. Um, you know, we know that biodiversity has value as, uh, for example, <clears throat> as a, a source of pharmaceutical ideas. Uh, we know that this is, that's the bioprospecting model. We know that uh, biodiversity has value potentially as a sort of insurance against uh, the certain types of diseases affecting existing crop, uh, crop species and so on. But there's a, probably a lot of other values for biodiversity which we don't understand and haven't modeled and haven't attempted to, to assess at all uh, quantitatively. So yeah, that's one of my, my biggest areas there. Yeah, Bill, you wanna say in terms of damages that we don't fully understand in terms of modeling potentially catastrophic damages. I don't think there's been a lot of, um, well, effort, well, I just didn't say effort, but progress on those fronts. So I would add that to, to Jeff's concerns about biodiversity loss, which also on a certain scale would, would be a catastrophic damage. I'd just add that, um... As I've studied this over the years, the, the, um, the feeling I have in studying the, the, these massive change in our Earth systems due to, due to increased carbon dioxide is very fractal. That it, it's like one of these Mandelbrot diagrams where you've, I'm sure you've seen them. You, you go in and it's kind of like a snowflake and then you look and you look inside the little one of the flakes of the snowflake and it's another snowflake. And that's the feeling I have that we, we keep learning things. Um, it's the uh, unknown unknowns become the known unknowns and maybe then become the known knowns. But uh, it, it actually, we've, we have learned tremendous amount through our research efforts of uh, natural and social scientists in this area. Uh, and it's a very dynamic field, this, this unknown unknowns of known unknowns and so on and so forth. Um, and I'll just give you one example of something that was um, a big surprise and I don't think has been sufficiently incorporated, which is ocean carbonization. Um, for many years, uh, ocean carbonization was not part of the picture. Uh, it's not that it wasn't known, but somehow it was, it's like one of those things in our mind that sort of sits there and then in the back of your mind, and then all of a sudden comes in the front of your mind. And then all the, the oceanographers and the, and the climatologists said, oh, yes, ocean carbonization. We knew it's carbonizing, but we didn't really think about it. 
And so lots, and that's an example of how, as you look, you begin to look closer in this Mandelbrot diagram, you, you see all these things, you, they, they come, they, you, you see these things. Now, I think open, ocean carbonization is, is, is something that we haven't really, we don't, I don't think we have a clue about the impact. Well, maybe a clue, but only a clue about the impacts of ocean carbonization. I mean, uh, no more shellfish, um, way, way beyond that. And that's a, that, so that's a way of thinking about this unknown, but it's a dynamic process. It's, it, it's not, these unknowns, unknowns are not gonna be unknowns, unknowns forever because we're gonna, as we study, we, we, they become known unknowns. You know, I would just add, uh, I, another issue that's kind of always loomed large for me is this uh, idea of tipping points, uh, which the scientists often bring up. And it's an I issue where I keep feeling I need to learn more. I constantly feel like I need to learn more. And so I went to a conference on tipping points, actually. With, I was one of the few economists there. And I left there feeling like I knew less than when I had started. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was an unsettling feeling. So I, you know, sometimes I can't tell if these are like just scary things or uh, that are, you know, grounded in physics and science or, you uh, if they're, you know, just completely hypothetical. You know, the other thing I'll add to this, which actually causes me some stress, when you look at the response to the pretty low levels of migration that happened in the last decade. Michael, probably, could we just, before you leave, can yeah. we spend one minute on that? Yes. I, I just, could I just say one thing? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I, I, the one, there are the, there's a kind of standard list of tipping points. Yes, the yes. Ice sheet, the Antarctic ice sheet, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, ocean, the uh, meridian circulation, the monsoonal, the uh, Amazon rainfall. The methane system. time bomb, yeah, yeah. All yeah. these kinds of things. Yeah. So um, I'd say one, one thing, these are not hypotheticals. These are not just, these. I mean, there is a giant ice sheet. We know we know that these things have melted in geological time. So these are not these are not made up. We know that the, that the meridian circulation has reversed at least once in historical time. So the, these are not these are not just fantasies of the imagination. Um, and the second is there is there is a lot of work on this going on, and um, uh, among among natural scientists mm -hmm. and relatively little linkage between the natural scientists and the social science community. So that's an area that's very much one that could could use a lot of uh, integration there. But I think, I think, I'm not sure about being more confused or less confused, but I think that's something that is, re that is real. And those are, but they're, they're not infinite, but they're real. Yeah, so sorry, let me be more precise. Thank you for that. Uh, I think I had very naively thought, well, I'm going to go spend two days at this conference and I'm going to come back with some probability distribution functions uh, for these events. Uh, and I was saddened that I was not able to leave with those. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not real and uh, that there's not a solid basis for them. But uh, that's the sense in which I was a little, I was unsettled and felt that I knew, it maybe knew less than, because I probably had my own made up PDFs for them before. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is that the human migration, the possibility of large scale human migration, uh, that is something that, you know, I don't think countries are very well equipped to handle uh, economically, politically. Uh, I think countries really are in many, in many countries really are tribal in the sense that there's a sense of what it means to be an American, a sense of what it means to be Swedish or something like that. And having lots of people who have not had generations of inculcation is that I, I think is very complicated for societies. And when you see the numbers on the parts of the world, which, and this will happen slowly, uh, but when you see the numbers in the parts of the world where it looks like uh, there's life will become much, much more complicated and difficult and challenging. And then you see those vast swatches of Russia and Canada and Northern part, and you just kind of feel there's gotta be a mass over some time scale of migration there. And is the world capable of handling that? I don't know. Well, we'd have some test cases with some of the small island states in the relatively near future. I mean, sometime sort of by the middle of this century, it's certainly possible that uh, some of the small island states in the Pacific 
will become actually uninhabitable and we'll have to consider moving entire populations. And you know, the, the politics and the international legal dimensions of that are totally challenging. I have no idea how we're going to handle that, but uh, it'll be very difficult, clearly. Yeah, but that's they, they will still be a, only a small share in the receiving countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I wanted, there was another question I wanted to try and get all of you to talk about a little bit. Uh, I'm sure all of you face questions like this from your friends uh, and family. Uh, you know, what can individuals and institutions do uh, that are institutions that you participate in? Uh, employees at Google who seem quite upset uh, about energy consumption at server farms. Uh, what can they do to confront climate change? My, my, and I should mention, you know, my 18 year old who's writing college applications uh, tries to talk about some of this very same issues and the helplessness uh, that you can feel about it. Well, I mean, are you asking on a personal level what well, what we do or we what we can do? We esteemed <laughs> climate experts here. Uh, and uh, I'm posing the question to all of you. What would you recommend to people who ask you that? Well, one thing I do try to do sometimes is I do try to play the game of if there really were a high carbon tax, how would I react to it? What would I do if electricity cost 50 cents a kilowatt hour instead of 15 cents? Or if gasoline cost me six or seven dollars a gallon? And so I do try to take that into account in my behavior. I mean, I think people, before all of these new technologies come online, I mean, everybody's not going to go out and buy an electric vehicle, but they can certainly drive less. They can consume fewer kilowatt hours of electricity. I mean, this may seem trivial, but in terms of what you know, when you're asking what individuals can do, apart from perhaps what they can do politically and so forth, I thought you know, the, the question was really aimed at what private individuals might do if they were concerned about this. So I guess that's how I would answer it in the short run at least. In some places you can actually specify that you want to have renewable energy, a renewable electric power delivered. I and mean, that's true here in New York. I don't know whether it's true where you are now. So I mean I can tell Con Air, the local utility that I want to buy only solar or only wind or only renewable power. Um, and more people can do that. I mean that you know there's a slight yeah. extra cost to that, but it's very small. It's a cent a kilowatt hour or something of that sort. Mm -hmm. So a lot more people could do that. That would certainly be useful. And you know, driving electric vehicles, obviously. Um, and using public transport more than private transport, perhaps as well. I would, I would say two things. One is this is a public, uh, this is a collective active pro action problem. And so you've got to have enough people who want to take collective action. And so people, that's half of it. But the other thing, there is this, uh, it's not quite an envelope theorem, but it's like an envelope theorem, which is if we're optimizing our energy for our not take into account the externalities, then we can make some, maybe substantial changes in our footprint at virtually no cost. Uh, because the cost of the little first reductions are essentially zero. So if you had enough people understanding that they could reduce their carbon footprint by five or 10 percent, or maybe 20 percent, at virtually no cost, that would that would actually get a good start. Uh, and I don't I think that that's a kind of a mathematical theorem that's not obvious to uh, everybody and a uh, result of a mathematical theorem. And, but I think if, if you, we could figure a way to, to say that in in uh, in language that could be understood by everyone, you know, you can you can do your bit at virtually no cost because of the nature of this problem. It's not true of all other problems. You can't reduce your food consumption at no cost, but your your carbon footprint you can probably reduce substantially, or at least at virtually no cost. And I think that's an important thing to tell people and to have them tell their firms and you know have part of the ethics, the 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 ethics, the environmental ethics of the day. Okay, well, I think I'm going to disagree with all three of you. Uh, uh, I worry that uh, that leads to too much talk about, uh, I'll caricature it to make the point, of uh, composting and what to do with your coffee grounds and things like that. And I think in the end, around the world, uh, what we really get are the governments we deserve and the governments we demand. 
Uh, and I would say at the margin, I would encourage people uh, to get their governments to act uh, on this and that the, we need the urgency of the climate problem, in my view, requires kind of the force multiplier of decisive government action, be it on R&D uh, or be it on uh, pricing. And I, I worry that, there, uh, that uh, uh, taking actions in your own personal life, while certainly uh, beneficial, there's a limited, you know, bandwidth that people have for dealing with this. And that I, if, if I could choose, I would rather have them spend their energy on uh, demanding uh, political change. And I, I'll just point to what I think is one of the most remarkable things that I've ever seen uh, is if you think back not too very long ago uh, to that picture in Beijing, actually, uh, it was unimaginable. And just seven years ago, I think uh, that China would really become a forceful uh, in, in environmental regulator. Uh, and what you have experienced in seven years in China, which is admittedly a different political system, but one that you might not have thought would bend to democratic demands very quickly uh, is a remarkable change, uh, at least with respect to particulates pollution. And uh, they launched a war on pollution and there's been a very large change. And I, I think there's a lesson in that, not just for China, but for the rest of the world. Uh, that political action and demands, you know, it's not always a straight line, uh, but can lead to really uh, dramatic changes in policy. I mean, I agree with you, Michael. I mean, it, that's very important, although you can do both. Can um, do both. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we have just two minutes left. Is there anything any of you want to add? Uh, I just I want to say something, the disagreement with the disagreement. First yeah. place, I think, I, I think, I think all of us would agree that collective active action is central. But I think as a matter of behavioral psychology, which we're not, but we might wonder whether personal behavior and personal attitudes are affected by politics and politics by personal attitudes. And so when we teach our children about uh, turning the lights off, maybe they, that then turns them into better citizens as well. Uh, I, I don't think there's this clear separation between individual ethics and public ethics. Uh, so that's the one. So I think we need to reinforce. I think the, the, the key message yeah, here is we need to reinforce both. Yeah. Okay. So there's actually, uh, there's one minute left and it's actually not unrelated to what we were just talking about. Greg Ip asks, could growing low carbon ESG investment mandates for more of the world's asset management in industry catalyze enough private sector investment in green technologies uh, to make a difference, especially if public sector investment is inadequate. So I think we'll have to do this as a lightning round. We have one minute. So you each get uh, 20 seconds to answer that. And then I think we will close. Jeff should start. He's the Okay, so ESG is hard to interpret. Uh, you can, ESG can mean many different things, unfortunately. Uh, it doesn't always mean green investment. So I put that qualification in place. Um, then I'm going to go on to say that um, climate oriented, specifically climate oriented investment can have an impact. Yes, I think it's already having an impact on the behavior of some of the oil companies. I think social responsible investors are influential in some sectors. That's a very recent phenomenon. They've been around for a while. They're only recently having much impact on the climate area. I think that, that can encourage investment in this area and you can discourage certain types of investment as well, uh, which is good. Okay, I think Maureen and Bill will only have time for thumbs up or thumbs down. <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, this was terrific. Uh, quite an honor for me to be on the same panel with all three of you. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, this is a growing topic and an area where much more research is needed. And thank you all very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm.